This is Edwards! What do you want? This is Edwards. I know I ask you this like every week, but would you like to ride to church with me? Oh, come on, Mrs. Edwards, you'll like my church. We have some hot music. It may not be what you're bumping at all, but it's hot. We get down. What do you say, Mrs. Edwards? Oh, uh, I suppose. I've heard it said that 80% of first-time church visitors come because someone personally invited them. All people need to feel loved and wanted, and for some people, it just takes having someone offer to give them a ride to church. We have something great going on at this church. People's lives are being transformed by God's love. Your homework this week is to find at least one person who could use a little more of that love and invite them to come with you next week. Trust me, it's worth the extra effort. Mrs. Edward, you want to listen to some music on the way? Go ahead, your choice. <sighs> okay, here we are. <laughs> that was awesome. What would it be like if we all ministered like that? If we could all go out in the streets like that? You know, it reminds me of Sheila pulled in this morning. And uh, we can turn the lights up now. Sheila pulled in this morning. Sheila, where are you at? Raise your hand. Sheila, stand up. Let, let's see it. Sheila pulled in this morning, and I think she was kind of like that pulling in. She's like riding up like that, and she's... <laughs> She said, I got to go pick some people up, and I can just see her doing that. Thank you, Sheila. She goes, she literally goes and picks people up. Bob and Nancy go pick people up in the morning, so I'm grateful for that. We need to, we need to minister like that. We need to be able to grab a hold of this world like that, and um, thank you for sending me that video, Ted. Uh, I get all these um, emails and stuff, and that was just caught my attention really well, so I love it. I love ministering. I love talking to people. I love preaching. Um, and I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love what he's doing here in this place. I love seeing the new faces today. And um, I know if we just continue to grow like this, you know, and, and you guys come back beyond Easter, that um, we, will, we, will have to, uh, we will just have to move into a bigger place. And um, I... I I just, I'm not even finished building this place out, but it doesn't matter to me because I've already got my mind set on where we're going, where God's taking us from this point on. And I'm so grateful for that. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Yeah. We must continue to tell the story. We must continue to write it on our hearts and tell the story of Jesus Christ through the testimony that we live, through our lifestyle of living. We must continue to tell the story and write it on our hearts, on our children's hearts, on our grandchildren's hearts. It says, and after Jesus knew that all these things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture... He's hanging on the cross at this moment, and he said, I'm thirsty. There was a jar of sour wine standing there, so they put a sponge into the wine, and they put it up to his lips. And therefore, Jesus had received the sour wine, and he said these words, which are captivating he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the Holy Spirit. The story is not over just because Jesus said, it is finished. That part of the story is over. The part of the story that Jesus paid the price on Calvary Friday, we celebrated that, that he paid the price on Calvary for you and I. To have our sins forgiven. 
Like, like, listen, our sins are completely forgiven because of the price that he paid on Calvary. Mike and Becky, stand up. The, right, you stay right there. These two right here have been battling, battling drug addiction. I'm going to be frank. They've been battling. They've been throwing themselves back into it and away from it and back into it and away from it and back into it. But Jesus has gotten a hold of them. Today, they're 41 days. 41 days. Free. Because when we try to do it, thank you, when we try to do it in ourself, we're not going to be able to. But because of the blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary, because of Jesus sealing that deal, he said it is finished. That means for you and I, it is finished. That the, the, It's sealed. We cannot change that. He paid the price for sin for now and forevermore. So, it, so we, if we stop there, where would we be? The story don't stop there just because he finished. You know, Dale Earnhardt getting ready to come up the Indy 500. When he races, he didn't spend his whole life to prepare for one race. And then he gets to that race and he hits the finish line and he wins. And he says, okay, I'm done. Because the race is over and he's finished. No, he keeps on going to win more and more and more and more. And that's what Jesus did. He kept on going. That's what we're supposed to do is to keep on going to share the testimony of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can't imagine what it would be like without Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What would we live? What would we know? What story would we tell if they had not have told us their story, their encounter with Jesus and what they had saw? That story is carried on for 2,000 years and more. And what I want you to know today that you have a story and God wants your story to carry on to your children and to your grandchildren and to your grandchildren. And it's going to take a lifestyle like that, living that kind of a lifestyle, rolling up on someone's house week after week after week, asking them to come to, to the house of the Lord, telling them about Jesus and the love of Jesus. That's what we are supposed to do. So the price has been paid on Calvary. We know that. We've established that. But it don't mean it's over. You no longer have to live in the bondage of sin. The chains have been broken. The chains have been broken. If you are living in a bondage of sin, it's because you want to live in that life of sin. Jesus freely gave us this gift that we can receive it, break all chains, and walk in a new life. Like I said, with Kaneo class, it's not going to be easy. It's a process for some. It's immediate for others. It's a walking out this thing day by day, daily dying out to the things of the world, stepping into the things of God. Letting heaven reign more and more and more in your life and your way of living. And in a Western culture, we don't understand that. We have been taught just to surface the Bible, to surface read it, or to just listen to the pastor and what the pastor has to say. Stop. Don't just listen to what I have to say. Find out for yourselves. Like the woman at the well, find out for yourselves. When she was at the well, Jesus told her everything about her life. And then she went to tell everyone in the city. And then everyone in the city believed because of her testimony. And then they went and saw Jesus for themselves. And they come back to her and said, we no longer believe because of your testimony. But we have our own testimony now. So we have to have our own testimony and walk with that testimony. So our children and our grandchildren and their children can see the love of God. I have 10 grandchildren and I'm so grateful I get to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. I am so grateful. I cannot wait to hear their stories about what they've gotten to do. How they've gotten to minister to other people like my sons have gotten to minister to other people. I cannot wait to see how their story goes. And to live that long. I'm trying to live healthy so I can live long. So I can hear some of their stories of what they want to do. And your story will depend on, the writing of your story will depend on your, the choices that you make in life. We can choose to live for God or we can choose not to. That's our prerogative. He don't force us to serve him. 
He cannot force us to serve him. But we freely get to choose to serve him. We freely get to live for them. Shelly said last week, the kids come out and was telling us about how kids were healing kids. Jesus said, he didn't say go pray for the sick. He said go heal the sick. So we're activating that in our children to go and heal the sick. And that's what they're doing. They're praying over people and people are getting healed. I know they were here last week praying. I don't know who was down here praying, but um, they pray with an adult down here. And I don't know the outcome of that, but I know the outcome of back there that by their testimony that someone was healed. Someone's leg grew out. The testimony that they gave. And we can't deny their testimony. We have to believe what they're saying is true by the walk that they walk. Two weeks before that, Pastor Derek was here. And his children on fire for Jesus. On fire for Jesus. They asked him back in the kids' church. They said, if, if, uh, if, you, if you fear at night, who do you go to? So the kids were saying, well, I'll go to my daddy, and I'll ask my daddy, and I'll go, and that's good. I'll go to my mom. Derek's little girl says, well, you know what? We can go to Jesus. She said, because perfect love casts out fear. Little girl. The boy was out, four years old. The little boy was out in the other, other part of the church, and they started talking about the same type of things about healing. So he steps down off the bleachers and he starts looking at them and just puts the teacher behind him and starts telling them about the love of Jesus and about what Jesus can do in their life to change their lives. I'm sure some of you have story of your children telling the story of Jesus. My son Austin, when, when, when he was, when I think he was around four years old, I would take him out and we go, go sat, every Saturday we'd go knocking on doors. Knock, and you would not believe what you get. I mean, go knocking on the door with me. You not believe what you get. I mean, you knock on the door and someone will say, I'm already a Christian. What do you want? Go away. You know, and I've had guns pulled on me. I've had, I'm downtown Indianapolis, man. I was in the heat of it. Guns pulled on me. I've had people look at me and do this and, and tell me they're going to shoot me. I didn't care. I, it didn't bother me. I was like, do it. Come on, let's see what happens. No, I didn't want them to. But I mean, I'm just saying, I literally didn't care what they said because I was so on fire for Jesus. This is when I was a new Christian, man. I was like, bam, I was like zealous. And I don't know if I'm still that zealous or not. I might be, I don't know. But I was just out in the streets doing whatever God said to do. And then we went to this one house and, and I remember, I remember I said, I said, sir, I would love to invite you and, and, and to church. We got a church down here, and this was in Terre Haute. We got a church down here, and I'd love to invite you to church. And he said, I'm not interested. So he had the screen door open. He said, I'm not interested. And he went to close the door, and my four-year-old son stuck his foot in the door. <laughs> and he grabbed it. And he said, but your kids can go. And the guy let go of the door, and his kids come to church that Sunday and got saved. We can leave a testimony to our kids and show them how to walk the walk, how to live this life. Yes, it's going to be trial and yes, they're going to have questions. And we're going to be able to give them the answers according to the word of God. But also teach them to go to the word of God and not just listen to the pastor. Listen to him, but, but test what he says. Make sure it's truth. Make sure what he's saying is true. My other son, Jared, he was about eight, and I heard some commotion behind the garage, and I thought, well, what, what's going on back here? And so I snuck around the edge of the garage just to see. He's got a group of boys back there, and he's telling about Jesus. He said, now, this was back when I was in the Holiness Church where you couldn't, um, where they said you couldn't watch TV. Um, and that's, that's a good, I look at it now, it's pretty good. I mean, there's nothing on worth watching, so... Um, but he said, listen, boys, and he's talking to him about Jesus. He said, now, now we're, not, we're not supposed to do this. And he's telling him about television and that green-eyed monster is what they used to call it, that one-eyed green monster. And, um, but he was telling them about Jesus. It was so valuable that, that he was telling them about Jesus and how much Jesus loved them and wanted a relationship with them. They're going to have questions. My son, Dusty, he's a musician, a songwriter. 
He wrote a song. And he said, in the song it says, why would you come down to this earth, come into this? Why would you come? Why would you come down to this earth, come into this land, just as God planned? Why would you heal the sick? Would you raise the dead, make the blind to see, and feed the poor? Because I know that you love me, no matter what I've done, no matter what I've said. Nothing will change your love. He had a question. Why would you come down here? Because of all that he had seen at such a young age. Why would you come to a people like this? When Jesus was on the cross, they were saying, crucify, crucify. The very people that had seen the miracles crucified our Lord and Savior. I'm thankful. I am thankful that Jesus paid that price for me on Calvary. I'm thankful, Mike and Becky, that I was able to step out of a life of drugs, a life of addiction, a life of chains that were broken off of my life so I could be in the center of what God has for me today. I am so grateful. I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful for the gospel for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'm thankful for the testimony that they carried that I could live because he lives. So today I want to celebrate Jesus. I know this is Easter. I'm getting ready to say something and I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. That makes sense. Don't hear what I'm not getting ready to say in your Western mind. I am not here today to celebrate a bunny. As cute as they are. I'm not here to celebrate a bunny. I'm not here to celebrate an egg. As much as we try to explain the Trinity through the egg. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit all in one. I'm not here to celebrate Candy and chocolate and all those things that we put into this holiday, as sweet as it is. I'm here to celebrate Jesus and the price that was paid on Calvary for you and for me. If you will look back at history, history is trying to erase Jesus out of everything. We can look back and see where history is trying to take the name of Jesus out of every single holiday. I've watched it. I've seen it. I've been at a store on, on Christmas. And how they have Halloween decorations on a Christmas tree. I protested and they took them down. They never did it again. I, don't let, I won't let it happen. I'll stand up and fight for what's right. There's cultural things that are in play, even with the tree, even with all the stuff, the decorations, all those things. Listen, if we study the culture, we'll understand this a little bit different. I'm not saying that it's not okay to do some of these things. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that we need to keep Jesus first in everything. We need to keep him first, center in every single thing. Every holiday, whether it's Christmas or Easter or whatever it is, even, even Halloween, keep Jesus first. Keep him first. So the story's not over. Today, what Jesus did today... So Friday, he died on the cross. He said, it's finished. It wasn't over. He went to the bosom of Abraham. Hades was split in half. There's a bosom of Abraham and there's hell. The Bible tells about it. If you read your Bible, it tells about a conversation that went on there. 
Then Jesus went from there to he rose again. So now we have freedom from sin. We have freedom from, from, from whatever the world wants to bind us down with. We're free from those things if we'll grab a hold of that. And then Jesus went to hell to set the captives free. And then now he rose so we could have eternity in heaven. He had to do all those things in order for you and I to be able to make heaven our home. But it don't stop there because there's a story that we have to tell to the world around us. Sheila, you do such a good job rolling up on people, inviting them to church, telling them to come, loving on them. That's one of my favorite parts of ministry. This part of it here is not my favorite part. My favorite part is going out in the streets and talking to people and telling them how much Jesus loves them by loving on them. And I've learned, if you walk with me, I've learned there's a balance. There's times that I can spit it out really hard. And there's the times I have to pull back and be soft and gentle. I have to read the situation and know the situation I'm stepping into. Because people get hurt easy. They get offended really easy. So I have to be careful when I'm ministering. You know, Mike and Becky, I can call them out day and night because they know where they've been. They know what they happened and they know what God's done to them. And I've been hard with Mike before. And I've been hard with Becky before. We have to be. But there's times we have to be gentle. And display that love in a gentle way. Love, love don't just always come a gentle way though. There's times that love can be harsh. And be, and, and be, and be um, a little bit abrasive sometimes. But it always draws people to the Father. Love will always draw people to the Father. So if you go out and you minister in love, regardless of how you do it, it will always draw people back to the Father because love trumps it all. Jesus defeated death on the cross. He defeated death on the cross. Would you keep Jesus center today? Would you keep him center of your life? Listen. Life is going to throw things at you. Some of them are going to hurt. But if we're positioned right with the Father, we're going to be able to walk through those things and get through those things. We have to position ourselves right with God, with the Word of God, rightly dividing the Word of God, making it, making it every bit of our life as much as we eat and drink and breathe. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 7, he said this. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course and I have kept the faith. Look at the testimony of Paul. He was a man that murdered people. And I think he probably enjoyed it at the time. But Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. And he had an encounter with Jesus. And through that encounter, Paul became a church builder. And he wrecked people for Jesus amongst all the wrecks that he was in. He wrecked them for Jesus. If we can have that kind of testimony. See, your story's not over. You're still writing your story. Can you imagine what your grandkids are going to say about you? What are they going to say about you? Well, Poppy, for me, I'll use me because I know me. Well, Poppy, man, Poppy would always tell me about Jesus. Every time that Poppy come around, it was, it, he loved, he'd tell me how much, he would always whisper in my ear how much Jesus loves him. How much Jesus loves me. I do. Every time I pick him up, I tell him how much Jesus loves him. I always say Jesus. Jesus. I'm always saying Jesus. I'll just say Jesus. I don't have to say anything else with it. I'll just say Jesus. Little Owen, he goes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Love their little voice. Now they're growing up and their voices are changing. Everything's changing. But they're going to tell the story of Poppy and what Poppy did. They're not going to know the bad things about my life. See, we could focus on the bad things that Paul did. But no, what trumps that is what he did in the end. The good things. The testimony there. We don't use, man, he was a murderer. No, we use, man, he was a revivalist. 
He was bringing truth to the church. He was laying it down like it was, laying the law down and, and telling the truth. And that's what we're supposed to do. Tell the truth about Jesus Christ. Tell the truth about the word, even if it hurts. Remember, when you're telling the truth, you, you talk to people. When they say they're a Christian, that opens it up. When they say they're a Christian, that means they're saying that they are complying with this. Then when they're not complying with this, you're able to open this up and say, Brother, sister, no, you're not living the way you're supposed to live. Because God says, Dad says, this is how we're supposed to do it. That gives you the right. It's not judgment at that moment. It's telling the truth, which sometimes looks like judgment. It's truth. And the truth will set you free. You have your Bibles. We're going to turn to John chapter 20, which is right after 19. Just in case. We'll make it good here. Keep Jesus center. He is our Savior. He died for you and I. He rose from the grave. And He is coming back. It doesn't matter how much the world tries to take His name out, He is coming back. The Bible says it every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Whether you want to or not, you will bow down to Jesus and confess that He is Lord and Savior. Whether the world takes him out or not, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Because they can't take Jesus out of us. They can't take Jesus out of us. Because we are the ones to share the testimony. That's why the word of God says, by the word of God and by our testimony. If they shut the word of God down and try to take it away from that, we still have our testimony of what God's done in our life, the encounter that we've had. And if you've not had an encounter with Jesus, that's what you need to have an actual encounter with Jesus. Not with man, because some have had an encounter with man, and they're living their whole life having that encounter with man and not an encounter with Jesus. We must have an encounter with Jesus. He's just stirring the water up. For someone to step in. Chapter 20, verse 1. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone had already been taken away from the tomb. And she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. I love, I love John here. He's just always talking like this. Tells a little bit more about himself. The one who Jesus loved. And said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple, John again, went forth. And they were going to the tomb. And the two were running together. And the other disciple, John, had ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. Listen, John talks about himself right here, how much Jesus loved him. You know, he ran faster. But there's one thing that John didn't have. He wasn't bold like Peter. He gets to the tomb. He stoops down and looks in and sees the linen cloth wrappings lying there. But he did not go in. Why didn't he go in? He just didn't have... He saw it, wanted it, talks about how much he loves Jesus, how much Jesus loves him, how fast he can run. But he gets to the actual problem or the actual situation, he couldn't step into it. And that's one thing that we need to learn to do is step into the situation regardless of how bad it looks, how hard it looks, how trying it's going to be. So Peter also came following him and entered the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there. And the face cloth which had been on his head was not with the linen wrappings, but it was wrapped up, folded up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first came to the tomb, then also entered. He finally come in after um, someone else stepped in first. You know, Shelly's kind of like that with me. We'll go out and minister in the streets, and she won't say a word to anybody until I start talking to them. And then she cuts me off and steps right in, which is all right. I'm her door that opens up and then lets her. She can have her way after that. It's, it's, it's all good. Um, yeah, she, when I pray, I love it. When I pray, I'll start praying. 
And um, she'll take over, and I'll say, honey, you, you didn't let me finish my prayer. She goes, okay, go ahead. And uh, that's all right. I love it because she's a prayer warrior, and she's an intercessor uh, warrior. So it's, it's a good thing. And it says in verse 9, it says, um, For they yet did not understand the Scripture that he must raise from the dead. So the disciples went their way to their own homes. And listen, this is what I believe they did. They started writing their story. When are you going to write your story and how are you going to write your story? What's it going to contain? Is it going to be full of battles and no victory? Or is it going to be battles with complete victory? There's going to be a difference in how your story is written. There's going to be a difference how your grandchildren and children tell your story. But you have to write it and you have to tell of it day in and day out. Because by the word of God and our testimony, lives will change. But the one part about this that you might not know, all of you, all, and some of you might know this, and it's, it's, a, it's a known story. Some of you might not. You all have a folded napkin. I believe everyone got one. So when, when a servant was serving the master, the table was set, everything was set in play. Everything was set perfect on the table, and the master would come in to dine at the table. And if the master had to, and, and, and the servant, listen, the servant was always watching in the distance, waiting to see what the master was going to do. Because they, they, they didn't want to step in too quick or too late. So they would step back and they would watch and see what the master is doing. And so if the master would get up, they would be ready to go and clean the mess up or clean the table up or bring the next dish out or, or, or what have you. But they, they, would, they would sit on and watch this. And if the master would get up, and if he would take his, his napkin, his cloth, his, his, um, this is what he wiped his mouth with. If he would take it and fold it and lay it down on the table, they would know not to come out and touch the table. Letting the servant know that they were coming back. See, if they wadded it up, it let them know that, that he's finished and that he wouldn't be back to the table. But you'll, you'll notice here that they saw the linen wrappings Jesus was wrapped up in. They saw these linen wrappings there and there was one that was on his head that was folded, nice and neat, separate from the rest. And that's telling us by the culture, not our Western culture, but by the, the Caneo, by the way they lived then, that when the napkin was folded, that means that, that the master will be back to the table to finish the meal. And Jesus is coming back to finish what he started. He died on the Calvary and he rose from the grave and he said that he's coming back and he's taking us with him when he does. And we're going to reign for a thousand years in this world. And there's going to be a new world, a new place for all of us to go. And no one can even imagine what it's going to be like. But I cannot wait until my Savior comes back because I am going to be riding with him. And I am going to be conquering with him. Because that's what his word says. So I'm grateful for Jesus. That he is coming back. I'm grateful that it's not wadded up. That it's not over. Your life is not over. It's not over. Let's stand. Let's stand. Thank you Father. Thank you Jesus this morning. Turn the ambient music on please. My heart is heavy for you this morning. They went to write their story. Jesus has already written the story. Because you're alive, your story is still being written. Paul was telling us about his life and about how faithful he had been coming to the end of his life. Fought a good fight. Have you fought a good fight?
He's finished his course. He's watered up the napkin. He's finished his course. He's kept the faith. Your course is not over. God wants you to have greater faith than you've ever had. We're living in times that are, that are not easy. We're living in times like we've never lived before. Our generation, moms and dads, has never been through what we're going through right now. And we must rise up. We must grab the truth about Jesus and the faith that he has for every one of us to press on and press in to our lives and change our lives so that other lives can change with us. If you have wounds today, I ask that you would come forward. We're going to pray for you. If there's wounds in your heart that are not healed from a child up, that you're still living out of those wounds, or you've got walls up that are so tight, the Holy Spirit can't invade those places. Take those walls down just for a moment that he can come into your life and change you forever. If I could tell my story from a drug addict to a heathen to a thief I've been so free it's hard to name all the stuff I've been through God's freed me so much but I know it was it was hell from all those things that I've done and I've been involved in to being in a position, honored in a position to be able to speak to you and tell you what God did for me. I, I have run a good race, but it ain't over. My race is far from over. And I'm keeping the faith because I'm keeping myself centered up on Jesus. I'm keeping myself in the Word. Even though I've got t 10 grandkids and 5 kids and a full-time church, it's a lot. You guys probably think I don't do much of anything, but let me tell you, my day is full of phone calls, texts, emails. That's just from people. Some, uh, some don't even come here. And they're pulling from resources that I really, it's hard to do sometimes. So that's why I want you to keep me in your prayers as well for strength to just keep pressing in. Because it's not easy. Preaching part's easy. The ministering part in the streets is easy. The shepherding, pastoring is the hard part for me. Because my mindset says, just get rid of it and move on. Because that's what I did. So it's hard for me to pamper people in certain places that they're in and just kind of coach them out of that it's not my makeup, my makeup is get right or get left but I'm learning how to be more gentle and loving people well is there anybody that needs to pray this morning just be honest with yourself forget about everybody around you be honest with yourself what would your story look like what would your grandkids tell about you? Would it, be a, would it be a gospel story or would it be something else? Write your story. We're going to still, we're going to stay right here for a minute. I'm going to pray. The Lord's tugging on your heart. Man, listen, I remember I remember those days when I was sitting in church and he was tugging on my heart and I was moving back and forth, wanting to go. I was worried about what's going on around me, worried about what people would think. It doesn't matter if you if it doesn't matter if you what you've done. It doesn't matter. As soon as you give it to God, it's forgiven as far as east is from the west, never to be remembered against you again, ever. The only way you'll remember it is you remember it against yourself. Because he done forgot about it. Father, we just thank you this morning. God, we thank you for who you are, for who we are in you, Lord, for that place in your heart.
that you've made for every one of us, God, that we could have an eternal life in heaven, that we could have a life that's free from bondage, free from sex addiction, porn addiction, drug addiction, whatever kind of addictions that we have. God, every chain has been broken. When you said it is finished, you sealed the deal that we could have a free life and freely walk in it. And I thank you, God, right now that you're moving on the hearts of your people. You're loving them. God, you're blessing them. And you're going to continue to move in their lives. They continue to walk with you. Lord, I thank you for the ones that came today. I thank you, Lord, and I pray that every church in this region is full today. I pray, Lord, that every church in this region, every part of the body in this region, the word got out. Hearts were changed. Lives were changed. Souls were saved because of the name of Jesus. Father, I ask that you would help us as part of the body of Christ. To center up with Jesus. Center up with other parts of the body. That we can be totally free. Totally healed. From all infirmities. From all sickness. From all bondage. We thank you. We glorify you. In Jesus name. Amen. Greet one another. Love on one another. Have a super, super Easter. Hope to see you next week. God bless you.